uh, hopefully I make it exciting enough. Thank you for the opportunity. So our goal of knee arthroplasty, of course, is to have a forgotten knee joint forever. And talk of surgical utopia, we think of, we want to restore native anatomy and kinematics 100%. We want patient satisfaction 100%. And we don't want to have failures ever. All of this keeping in mind that every knee is unique. So there are three impact factors, that, and all of them affect kinematics. Um, in spite of implant design constraints and limitations, we would ideally want to achieve true bone resurfacing for the trochlea, femoral condyles, tibial plateau in all partial and total knee replacements. We want to understand native ligament laxities in flexion and extension better and try and replicate them. And we want to align the components at the knee and uh, possibly with the entire lower limb in perspective, keeping that in mind, not preoperatively, but to the pre-arthritic status. So what is native alignment? Uh, constitutional alignment, we can think of it in three planes. And talking of the axial plane, we try and place the components and see how the femoral torsion is using the PCA or the flexion, uh, transepicondylar axis or the cylindrical axis. And the tibia using the shape of the tibial plateau or the different forms of the Akagi's line. But we know for sure that all of this is, uh, has a lot of variance. Uh, Dr. Mulaji is published in the Indian population as well. Very variable. And how do you decide uh, whether these torsions are worsening with arthritis and what the pre-arthritic torsion was? In the sagittal plane, we know that the femurs flex three degrees to the mechanical axis. And the tibia, of course, has a different slope on the medial side, has a different slope on the lateral side. Females have higher slopes. Indians have higher slopes than Caucasians. Uh, it's different. Uh, does the slope worsen with osteoarthritis? It does. So how do we, during surgery, think of going back to where the pre-arthritic slope was? Difficult. On the coronal side, though, it's a little easier because we know there's asymmetric reduction of the tibiofemoral joint space. So we know where the varus lies possibly close to the joint line in the femur. We know varus or valgus. We know how the tibia is. And both the LDFA and the MPTA can allow us uh, uh, to, co to be correlated with the hip, knee, ankle axis. We know that the joint lines at the femur and the tibia are pretty much parallel to each other in normal people. And then these joint lines converge in one direction or the other that leads to loss of joint space on the medial or the lateral side, which then changes the hip, knee, ankle angle or axis. So if there is no great bone loss, on the particular side of arthritis, we can use the MP MPTA and the LDFA to estimate how the hip knee ankle axis or how the femur and the tibia were close to the knee joint before the arthritis set in. So almost all patients uh, would be in a varus neutral and valgus calculated on the basis of the MPTA and the LDFA and we estimate that now we know what a particular patient could would have been before the arthritis set in. So at least we have a target. Same thing about the joint line. We could probably estimate how the joint line was before the arthritis set in. And considering the joint line obliquity and the arithmetic HK, which is the estimation of what the alignments were before the arthritis, we can divide these patients into these nine classes. We also know that most of Indian patients are lying in a class one, type one or a type two. So if we do a knee arthroplasty in a systematic fashion and make all knees straight, we bring them all to a type five. Would you want to know, would you want to do that in every case now that we know more about the native alignment, at least in the coronal plane? So we need to keep all three things in mind though. We need to know that uh, the joint surface, true bone resurfacing needs to be done. The tensions need to be slightly closer to what the native tensions were and the alignment. So just demonstrating a case, uh, the preoperative LDFA is 87, the MPTA is 86, right knee is varus arthritic, uh, and the right knee now has full thickness cartilage loss, you'll see next, on the medial femoral condyle and the trochlea. Whereas the lateral condyle, distally and posteriorly, has good cartilage. So we now use uh, technology to see on the bottom side of the screen how the medial side is tight compared to the lateral. And we put the femur in the same LDFA, three degrees of valgus. And we had the MPTA that was 86. 
So we can put the tibia in four degrees of varus. At the same time, keeping the joint morphology, you can see the trochlea matching on the right-hand side top. So we're cutting 7.5 distal medial, 9.5 distal lateral, 9.5 posteriorly on both sides, assuming that I'm using an implant that resurfaces 9.5 at all these four points. So if you get the soft tissue tensions matched, the bone morphology reshaped, and fall within the alignment parameters, wouldn't that be nicer? So we should start rethinking how we plan. There are so many ways, uh, yeah, probably infinite variations into how these components can be put in. But since this is a sports medicine conference, a good analogy is a control to chaos continuum, right? Uh, so just how uh, we rehab patients post an, uh, an injury, all the fixed target guys, uh, so you're doing mechanical alignment, anatomic alignment, you're aiming for control. And then a true kinematic alignment is an infinitely variable target. Maybe the sweet spots um, right in the center somewhere and you find your own sweet spot. I loved what Dr. David Parker had to say uh, on Thursday and he said that do what works best with your resources. But that small point added by Dr. Brett was uh, we can always try to do better. Uh, that's what we should try at. Thank you.